Hello and welcome to the talk on MyTile, a storage engine built on top of TileDB and the advanced pushdown we offer through the storage engine APIs. Before we talk about the pushdown, let me summarize a little bit about who we are and what TileDB is and how it facilitates the advanced pushdown capabilities um, that we take advantage of in MariaDB. So TileDB was spun out of MIT and Intel Labs in 2017. Stavros, our founder, was working uh, at Intel dealing with high-performance computing and the database gurus of MIT, uh, and a lot of the data science uh, aspects that were around the Cambridge area. We've raised over $20 million so far, so we're very well capitalized. We've got uh, about 40 employees with domain experts all across the field. Um, traction with telecoms, pharmacies, hospitals, uh, geospatial areas, and other scientific organizations. So we've got quite a, quite a diverse use case. So what is TileDB? Well, the secret behind TileDB, the secret sauce, so to speak, is the data model. Everything in TileDB is modeled as a multidimensional array. So we're in array storage that allows you to have either dense arrays or sparse arrays. A dense array, as we see on the, the left-hand diagram here, is an array which has every single cell filled in. So every cell has a value. Um, a sparse array, on the other hand, has missing values, and those missing values are not materialized on disk. So those cells are not stored as nulls. They're, they're, they're not stored at all. They're completely not materialized. Um, inside any, every cell, you can have a tuple of values. So we call those attributes. So every cell can have any d different data types, um, integers, strings, date times, with var variable length, list, or fixed length attributes there. So a wide variety of data can be captured by these models. A sparse array also allows you to have multiplicities or duplicates. So every single data type, more or less that's structured, can be captured under the array model. For instance, if we talk about a data frame or a traditional table from a SQL database, every column or row uh, can easily be modeled in one of two ways. The first is a dense vector where the single dimension value is basically the row ID. This works really well if you have like a traditional auto increment style where you just in indicate the row ID. And then every single cell again contains the tuple of attributes or the, the columns that exist. This allows super fast slicing based off the row IDs. You could also mar model a table as a sparse array. So if you had a primary key or an index uh, that had multiple fields in it, you could model it as a sparse array. So instead of a row ID form, you could actually have the dimensions as different fields in the sparse array. This allows super fast column uh, slicing based off that. We can also support duplicates in the sparse array if, uh, if you don't have unique primary keys. What else can be modeled as arrays besides tables? We can have 3D LiDAR point cloud data. You can have imaging data like SAR. You can have uh, genomics data um, like VCF, uh, BAM files, 3D sparse arrays, single cell genomics, uh, biomedical imaging. Any type of imaging could be 2D or 3D. Uh, Two-dimensional XY, three-dimensional would include time. Um, any type of time series data, it can be modeled as uh, dense or sparse arrays, weather data, graphs, videos, key values, simply using uh, strings as one of your dimensions, um, and, and even flat files. So we actually are able to, uh, to store any type of file as a one-dimensional dense, uh, dense array also. For instance, we have an integration with Jupyter Lab where we actually store Jupyter notebooks, um, which are JSON files, as one-dimensional dense arrays. So we're truly universal here. So what are some of the features of TileDB Embedded that facilitate all of this uh, and, <laughs> and allow some of the, uh, the awesome push down that we're going to talk about in just a moment? Well, first off, um, TileDB is built in C++. Um, modern C++ taking advantage of C++ 17, so we have a lot of, uh, 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 of optimizations there. It's fully parallelized. It's a columnar format. We support a multitude of compressors, and every attribute or dimension, so basically every field, can have its own compressor, uh, such as run length encoding, ZSTD, uh, double deltas, um, multitude of uh, filter and compression options there. For sparse arrays, we use R trees uh, to catalog the non-empty uh, cells. We also support rapid updates and data versioning, so every write that occurs is immutable. It writes to what we call a fragment. We'll talk a little bit about the fragment architecture in just a moment because that's also part of our pushdown capabilities. Um, but because of the immutable writes, it's lock-free. This allows for parallel readers, parallel writers, because we never update any file once it's uh, finalized. Um, you can have simultaneous readers and writers with zero locking. This also enables time traveling capabilities, so you can look at what the array is over time. This allows a lot of flexibility, especially in MariaDB, for you to query an array, see what uh, the data is today, see what the data was like a week ago, a month ago, any arbitrary times. Um, 
provides incredible auditing capabilities. So we have a, a lot of interoperability. We have a number of APIs, Python, R, Java, C++, um, and a number of integrations um, in the domain-specific tools like GDAL and Poodle, uh, more generic tools like Presto and Spark, and of course, MariaDB, which we're here to talk about today. We also support a large number of backends. For instance, uh, Postfix file systems, object stores like S3 or uh, Azure Blob Store, could even be shared file systems like LustreFS or, or NFS mounts. An important thing, too, is because of the immutable rights that we do, we're completely optimized for the cloud. So the the LSM-like tree structure that we have works very well for cloud object stores, where immutability is key. And we optimized for parallel I.O. and to minimize requests, because object stores are not local file systems. There's latency involved um, with some operations, such as listing. Um, there's minimum uh, boundaries for uh, requests that can come in, and we do a lot of work to optimize for those cases. So let's take a little, let's take an overview of my tile. Now that we have uh, kind of a foundation of how TileDB is, the multi-dimensional aspects and, and features it offers, let's talk a little bit about the storage engine itself. So my tile is built on top of TileDB Embedded, so all the features that we just talked about are included in the my tile storage engine. Some of these key features include the ability to query tile to be arrays on remote object stores. So you can actually query directly from S3 or Google Cloud or Azure right through MariaDB. We have full dynamic discovery of existing arrays, so you don't need to create the arrays through, through MariaDB. You can have an existing array on S3 and query it live. So a select star just works um, with giving it an S3 path. We have complete interoperability with existing arrays and all of our other APIs. So the MyTile storage engine doesn't do anything specific with TileDB. Uh, it's not a custom schema. There's not custom um, uh, metadata stored or anything like that. Any arbitrary array can be read through um, MyTile. You want to read an image? You could simply you could do that. Um, this is in contrast to say MyRox, which has a custom schema for how it works with MariaDB. As we mentioned, MariaDB uh, MyTile. Uh, is built on top of TileDB. TileDB has a lock-free structure, so we inherit all of that in MariaDB here with MyTile. No need for row-level locks, no gap locking, no even table locks, full multi-reader, multi-writer for maximum parallelization. And of course, one of the big features is condition pushdown, which we're here to talk about today, and how we take predicates in um, other conditions and push them from MariaDB through the storage engine to the TileDB library directly. So we can actually push conditions on both dimensions, which are indexed fields, or attributes, which are non-indexed fields. We'll talk a little bit about the differences uh, coming up shortly. So let's go with an overview of how the condition pushdown works, because MariaDB offers a number of ways for us to perform these type of pushdowns. The first and most simple way is index lookups. So we can expose things through indexing um, in MariaDB. This also facilitates the multi-range reads, which also work on top of uh, indexes. We'll talk a little bit uh, about that in just a moment. Lastly, and probably most importantly, is the condition pushdown API, which allows us to push conditions on dimensions or attributes that can be uh, a number of different um, predicates, and they don't rely on index uh, style scanning. So a dimension in TileDB is similar to a primary key or an index. So when you create your array in TileDB form, you specify the dimensions, um, and you specify the order and the data types. And these can be most... Um, similar thought of like a primary key. For sparse arrays, we use R trees uh, as the underlying lookup for the non-empty cells. Dense arrays, however, do not need any additional indexing. Because the dense array is based off integral values and every single cell is populated, any location can easily be computed. Uh, the dimensions plus the layout structure define the sort order on disk. So this translates from the multidimensional space of an array to the one-dimensional linear storage medium uh, that is an object store or a local file system. Um, this can be thought of similar to a clustering index. So a clustering index defines you know, a list of, uh, uh, of fields, which will be the sort order. The dimensions define your sort order, and the layout also defines the sort order. So you can have row major layout, you can have column major, you can have Hilbert uh, order if you, uh, if you want to give uh, no preference to any special dimension. So those fields uh, and options combined are defined what the actual sort order on disk is. Attributes uh, are 
fields that are not indexed. They are stored as separate files because we're a columnar format, but they can be considered uh, as part of the tuple of an individual cell. And we actually do offer filtering on these non-indexed fields through what we call the query condition API. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. The most important thing to understand, though, is that the predicates, even for uh, attributes, can be applied completely in parallel. So we have massive performance um, capabilities by the, the, the parallelization that we do as we read the tiles um, from the individual storage. We'll go over the specifics next. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the query magic. How does how does a tile to be query work? How does it plug in with MariaDB and my tile? And how do does all this push down um, actually be facilitated? So it's important to understand the foundations first of tile DB queries because that this is the the magic behind the push down. So an array is made up of immutable fragments. A fragment can be considered uh, as a folder or a prefix on an object store, which contains the actual data uh, that's written. Uh, this data is stored in tiles. And there's also some metadata about the fragment itself. Every fragment has the details of its non-empty domain. That is, for every dimension, we have the bounding box of what, what, uh, what the dimension contains. And then inside every fragment is one or more tiles. Tiles are the physical grouping of data on disk. And the tiles are broken into 64 kilobyte chunks. So if we take a look at uh, this diagram, we can see that the basic folder structure here is we have a we have a, a high-level folder for the array, my 2D sparse array. Inside of that, we have the array schema, and then we have a fragment, T1, a UUID1. Inside that fragment is the metadata, which is a very small file, usually kilobytes in size, that contains uh, contains this basic information. Um, and then we have the actual data files themselves, um, A1 for the first attribute, A2 for the second attribute, and so on. And as you write the data, every, um, in TileDB, we create fragments for every single write. Um, so you can write in bulk, you can write individual cells, we support a number of, uh, of parameters there, but once a write is complete, uh, that fragment is immutable and we'll never touch it again. So this facilitates a lot of the querying mechanisms that we have. So we apply ranges on dimensions in several ways. So when we push down uh, the conditions and push down a range, TileDB is a range-based uh, query system, there's a multitude of ways that this filter is, is applied to get the performance um, that we'll show shortly. First is we prune these fragments based off the non-empty domain. So every single fragment that's written, again, is immutable and contains its non-empty domain. So right off the bat, we can prune uh, which fragments overlap with the query that's being issued. Next, inside of fragment, we have the tile, um, we know the tiles, and we have the minimum bounding rectangles of each tile, so we can prune those tiles, uh, again, based off the ranges without comparing individual cells. And then finally, after we know the tiles that, that overlap, we'll go through and we'll match the individual cells in those tiles to the conditions that were applied. Every single stage here, all three of these stages are done in, uh, in parallel to maximize performance. So the fragment pruning is in parallel. We loop over the fragments uh, in a parallel for loop to figure out which fragments uh, uh, line up. Next, we read the tiles in parallel um, to allow you to, um, sorry, we, we read the tiles in parallel to allow for um, the pruning to happen again in parallel. What are, the non, what are the MBRs of the tiles? Which ones line up? And then we fetch those from disk in parallel and then do the individual cell filtering in parallel. Now, of course, we offer memory budget parameters to control all of this parallelization. So you have ultimate flexibility to maximize performance versus uh, memory usage uh, in the different environments. Tile to be attribute filters, so filters again on the non-index fields, uh, work via a query condition API, and we apply them in parallel at the tile level. So after we prune a fragment and we're looking at the tiles and we're comparing the, the actual cells on a tile, we can then apply the, uh, the conditions. We have special care that's given to the code as we develop this feature to ensure that we vectorize all of these um, conditions and they are applied you know, in parallel and completely vectorized with vectorized instruction sets. Pushing the filters, um, either on the dimensions or the attributes like this and the predicates, to the storage engine and to TileDB allows us to return less data to MariaDB. This facilitates uh, a large amount of the performance improvements that we have because we can prune the data, re reduce the I.O., and return less data into MariaDB so MariaDB has to process and then potentially discard less rows. Um, and this is most beneficial when you have nice scanning, and especially if you have like aggregations, uh, we can do a lot of the pruning um, to return the data, and so that the aggregations can be performed much faster. 
So let's talk a little bit about how index lookups work. Um, this is the most uh, basic pushdown that happens is with an index scan. Dimensions in TileDB are exposed to MariaDB as either an index or a primary key. We use an index if it's a sparse array that allows duplicates, else we use a primary key uh, to indicate uh, the dimensions. Um, an index condition is translated into the TileDB query range and query uh, uh, syntax. TileDB, again, uses range-based queries, so we expect a start and an end range for every single dimension. Um, and so we translate the index usage uh, from MariaDB and the key uh, values into the TileDB syntax to perform these. And so we support every single operation, greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to, and all the different permutations on the, uh, the R key function. So uh, next after, next before, exact equals, all the different permutations are supported and we can handle for all the different date type, data types, strings, integers, date times, um, all of that can be supported with integer lookups. Now, besides integers, um, I'm sorry, besides indexes, we can use multi-range reads. What is a multi-range read? Some of you might not be familiar. Um, multi-range read is an optimized uh, optimization aimed at improving performance of I.O. bound queries that need to scan lots of rows. Um, this is pulled from the MariaDB wiki. TileDB is most performant when we do large bulk access, not repeated single access. Um, this is mostly an artifact of cloud object stores. If you're on a local file system, you have a lot more freedom with, uh, with reads. But object stores are designed for high throughput, um, but they also have high latency. So single individual record request from, it, from an object store uh, is not optimal. You want to fetch large contiguous chunks of, of the data from S3 or other object stores. Multi-range reads allow TileDB to efficiently fetch this data at scale because an index scan might ask for a small subset of the data. But a multi-range read allows us to get the predicates up a, uh, ahead of time to know that there's a large uh, read that's happening and we can optimize that at the storage engine level. TileDB supports the concept of incomplete queries, and so does MyTile, which allows us to do this batch-style access for out-of-core operations. So if a multi-range read comes in that wants to fetch records, uh, you know, uh, a million records, but we only have the memory space or, or um, for, you know, 100,000 records, TileDB can still handle this, and it handles it very efficiently. And on the MariaDB side, we take the the original request for the million records, we push that to TileDB, and we let TileDB facilitate how many records that it can fetch at a time. This allows TileDB to be optimal with the access to the object store, because it knows what the tiles are that are going to be read, it knows where the overlaps are, it knows uh, where best to split a, uh, a query um, for optimal um, usage. Now, depending on your uh, MariaDB instance and configuration, multi-range reads are typically not enabled by default. Um, we recommend for my tile usage that everyone always enables this um, for our users. Uh, now, if you're using InnoDB and MyRox and, and, and you're, you're potentially mixing other storage engines, you know, that needs to be considered. Uh, but if you're just using um, my tile directly, we strongly recommend it. There can be a large performance improvement over just uh, traditional index scanning by allowing TileDB to fully control how and when to, uh, to batch out the reads. Now, multi-range reads provide a lot of performance improvement, but condition pushdown via the condition push API uh, gives us the ultimate flexibility and ability to push anything into TileDB. So the condition push API has been around for quite a long time. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, uh, pushdowns um, available, and the Connect Storage Engine has long used it to push um, predicates and things from uh, MariaDB into the, the connected uh, other databases. And the nice part is that this whole API allows TileDB to take any part of the query that, that is supported and push it to the storage engine instead of MariaDB using it. So we use this um, to find any predicates that are on dimensions or attributes and push it to TileDB. There are many cases where MariaDB and the query optimizer might not use an index scan or the multi-range reads um, because the condition is maybe not prefix-based or doesn't line up with uh, with the 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 uh, primary key quite exact. So for instance, if you have three fields in a primary key and the condition's only on the first and the third, MariaDB uh, quite often will not use the, the primary key um, because it doesn't line up with the, the full prefix. However, in TileDB, um, we're not limited by these type of uh, these constraints and you can push that down and achieve optimal performance. So 
we can handle any combination of dimensions um, on you know con and conditions. It could be on one, it could be on three, it could be on all of them. It can be mixed and matched. Doesn't even have to be in the right order. TileDB uh, can facilitate all of that um, for the pushdown. And so we're not restricted by the traditional key structure at all in TileDB. We're a lot more flexible, and performance improvements can be had at a number of places. It might not always be the most optimal query, um, but there is definitely performance improvements. So we use the condition push API to to take and push all of that down. Um, condition push also expands to functions. So not just uh, fixed values, um, such as what happens with index scans, uh, but we can actually take entire functions and push them down uh, into TileDB through this a API. Another important thing too is that the condition push allows my tile to detect if ordering is required or not. So this allows us to figure out does the records need to be returned in the row major order or the key uh, the key order that MariaDB expects, um, or can it be returned unordered? Um, in many cases, an unordered result might be acceptable. For instance, if this is just a simple summation, the order doesn't matter, uh, or a count query, the order doesn't matter. Um, in those cases, unordered results in TileDB may have um, a large performance advantage and potentially memory uh, advantage. And this is because if we don't have to worry about the sort, then as we're doing everything in parallel, we can return the records as fast as possible to MariaDB without worrying about the sort um, on the TileDB level. Uh, and again, this is just a, an optimization which in some cases um, can add up quite nicely, and the condition push allows us to expand on all of that. There's also a newer uh, select handler and a join handler um, and, and derive table handler that was added in MariaDB 10.4, um, mostly to support um, advanced usage with the, uh, the column store. Um, we are looking at expanding into using this on top of the condition push API. Uh, the condition push offers most of what TileDB needs at this point, but the select handler exposes uh, a tremendous amount uh, of value there, and so we're looking into that. All right, so... We've talked a little bit about how this works and how we do it, but let's look at some benchmarks for seeing the actual performance difference of the pushdown and comparing it to uh, some of the other storage engines. So we're going to run a benchmark, um, some benchmarks here. We used a, an AWS EC2 instance, an M5 4x large, 16 CPU, 64 gigs of RAM. Um, we have a variety of other uh, settings configured here. Everything available, uh, everything on these benchmarks is available on the GitHub repo. We'll also include that in the Zulip chat uh, after this. And uh, anyone can reproduce these. You can see all the, the full details, including the full MariaDB config. I, I've highlighted some of the, the, the base config options um, here. The main thing on this benchmark is we're using the New York City yellow taxicab data set, about four years of the data, which comes in at about 40 gigs of raw CSVs and 337 million rows in total. So this is a, a decent sized data set um, to show some of the performance benefits uh, of these pushdowns. So first off, let's look at the size of the data on disk. InnoDB uncompressed comes in at about 95 gigs. Uh, Zlib compression for InnoDB drops it to about uh, 59 gigs. MyRox, um, being columnar there, comes in at uh, 19 uh, gigabytes. And MyTile uh, with ZSTD, which is our default and highly recommend it, comes in at 6.2 gigs. So uh, huge, huge uh, space savings with MyTile with our columnar compression, our chunking and tiling, um, and the ZSTD compression. So the first benchmark that we're going to look at here is doing pushdown of, uh, of a single condition uh, on the DO location ID, which is not an index field. It's not a primary key. It's not indexed. Um, and so this is going to result in basically a full table scan for all of the storage engines here. There's about 295,000 records that match the where condition, which will be uh, included in the count query. I know to be uncompressed comes in at 17 minutes and 31 seconds, um, so it's the slowest of everything. I believe that's mostly due to this on disk storage size um, and the 32 gig uh, buffer pool size, um, causing uh, the the performance decrease there. Now, uh, Zlib compression for INODB uh, drops it quite a bit to 6 minutes 20 seconds. MyRox comes in at 5 minutes 23 seconds. MyRox with mostly default settings, so there, there might be some wiggle room for optimization in the benchmark. Um, but MyTile, we ran three different benchmarks here that I really want to call out. The first is a, is MyTile with local disk on the EBS volume. Um, without any pushdown, so no index, no range, uh, multi-range read, no condition push API. This is going to be a full table scan pushing everything um, to uh, MariaDB. This is the most uh, close example to InnoDB um, directly here. And here we have about 2 minutes and 45 seconds, so we're about two and a half times faster than InnoDB for, for this query. And again, that's without any pushdown. So we can already see that MyTile with our parallelization, smaller on-disk size, um, 
can, can do quite quite wonders uh, with this size data. Now, if we enable push down, so we allow the condition push API to push this into our query um, our query condition API for attribute filtering. Again, this is attribute filtering, not a range push down. Uh, we drop the time to just under a minute, so 59 seconds, um, just just about a minute here on EBS volume. So about five times faster than my rocks, about six times faster than inodb. Pretty impressive if uh, if I do say so. Um, and I also wanted to point out that, again, my tile works natively with cloud object stores. So uh, because I ran the benchmarks on AWS, I went ahead and used an S3 bucket to store this exact same data set. And we can see that the time came in at 1 minute and 10 seconds. So about 10 seconds slower uh, to run the query on S3 than local EBS volume. But that's still about six times faster, uh, five to six times faster than inodb directly. So the condition pushdown has a large advantage in uh, my tile here. The last benchmark that I'm going to highlight uh, on this call, again, we have additional benchmarks in the GitHub repo and additional details there, but is a, is a similar account query, but we changed the predicates to include uh, conditions um, that are in the primary key of all the tables. Um, but we also still included a DO location ID uh, for one non-indexed uh, non field. So it's not a complete um, a complete uh, lookup of the index. There will still will have to be some uh, some filtering in MariaDB. Now this is much smaller uh, matching records. About 412 records match this where condition. Um, inodb comes in uncompressed still at 21 minutes, almost 22 minutes. Uh, data the the data size there is really just killing it. Uh, there is definitely room for optimization on the uncompressed inodb. But if you switch over to zlib compression, which I'm sure most people would would just turn on compression, uh, we drop the the query time down quite drastically to two minutes and 59 seconds or uh, 56 seconds um, uh, there with the primary key lookup. So inodb works quite well with the primary key lookup here. Um, my rocks about four minutes and seven seconds. Again, the fault settings, probably some optimizations um, that could be done to improve that. But the thing that I want to point out here, once again, is uh, on the MyTile side. With EBS uh, disk and without any pushdown, no index lookup, no primary key, no condition push, uh, we still come in at about 2 minutes and 47 seconds. So the full table scan uh, still beats inodb, even with inodb using the primary key lookup. Now, <laughs> the real magic comes in when we do turn on those condition pushdowns. So when we're using the, the condition push and the multi-range reads, um, the EBS volume is 1.8 seconds. Yes, 1.8 seconds to get all the records back. Um, again, the, the benchmarks are up. I encourage everyone to come and, uh, and take a look at that. It is quite impressive what we get. Now, if you move over to S3 instead of a local disk, it's about 4.2 seconds. Uh, latency of S3 uh, hits you a little bit um, with fetching these uh, such small records here. Um, but 4.2 seconds is still quite impressive to the, uh, the minutes it takes um, for the other benchmarks, uh, the other storage engines here. So the condition pushed down to my tile, massive performance improvements um, and, and works very, very well with how TileDB is laid out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about real-world usage. We've seen some benchmarks here, but but where have we actually used this and, and, and where have our customers used it? We, in particular, we have one customer in the AIS market, this is ship location data, who uses um, my tile through our TileDB Cloud Serverless SQL offering. And they issue queries um, that are typically bounding boxes to view ships in an area. So they'll give a lat long query um, and potentially time um, for, uh, for a geographical region, say a particular port like uh, Shanghai. Um, they also usually include additional filters on like ship type, name, or nationality. So they might want to query for only oil tankers uh, or query for uh, a certain type of cargo ship. And when we added query condition push down, um, especially on the attribute filtering, uh, they saw a two to three performance improvement in the queries. Um, so quite a large performance improvement, and it works very, very well uh, for our users. Um, so we're very happy with the uh, the APIs that MariaDB offers to enable us to parse the parse the query condition and push down all of those predicates into a TileDB for maximum performance. Okay, so the last thing I want to highlight is just where can you try this? How can you get it? Uh, what What is out there? So we offer a couple different... Um, products in the company, um, Tile to be embedded is the open source software, and my tile is open source. We have it on GitHub. We're working to upstream it to MariaDB right now. Um, you guys can go install it. We offer Docker images. We offer Conda packages, um, a number of ways to, to get it. You can c compile it from source. Um, we have uh, an embedded build uh, in Conda that you can use with uh, with Python to directly uh, query it there. So we have quite a few ways to, to go grab it on the open source side of the house. 
Um, we also have um, our title to be cloud SaaS offering. And in the SaaS product, we do have uh, MyTile through our serverless SQL functionality. Um, so anyone can sign up for that. We offer you a, a $10 of free credit when you sign up. And you can run our serverless SQL uh, to experiment with MyTile um, today. So you don't have to, uh, to, to compile or install MyTile. You can use our serverless SQL to just dispatch the queries um, to the cloud and get your results back. Very easy way for you guys to, to run some quick tests. Um, and of course, Tyler Cloud is also available for enterprise where uh, everything could be deployed um, if anyone uh, was interested. So that's it. I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, for the time, especially thanks to the MariaDB folks for, for putting this all together. Um, we'll be in the Zulub chat uh, throughout the day and and for the foreseeable future. I'd love to discuss um, some of the use cases around my tile and some of uh, the uh, the push down um, capabilities um, that exist uh, for the different use cases. Thank you. So, good morning, Seth, and thanks for, for coming to the MariaDB SoraFest. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, my first uh, question is more of an observation than a, than a question. Uh, the world is full of storage engines that have found an edge case in which they compare better than, than InnoDB, and then they make that into something, try to make that into something generic. And, and that's the uh, eyes with which I'm looking upon most, most of the storage engines, including TileDB. But, but you convinced me in your presentation that it's not an edge case, uh, that this is not just a, a special case solution where, where there would be edge cases uh, where, where, where you will beat, beat InnoDB, although you beat in a DB quite well in, in, in the scenarios that, that you did. And I think that's, that seems to be something generic for particular use cases. Yes, well, I, I just want to start off and say, you know, INODB has been around quite a while, and there's a lot of use cases that it targets that it does excellent. And, and I agree with you that it's very easy to cherry pick any benchmark to make your stuff look good. Um, and so with that, you know, with TileDB, our main difference here is that we store everything as a multidimensional array. And that's really the foundational difference. And this works really well for, uh, you know, a number of use cases like I listed, including just basic tables. But one thing I want to be clear is that TileDB is not a transactional storage engine. We're based for large-scale analytics, OLAP-style queries. So if you have, you know, the transactional style, single insert workloads, you know, INODB still does, you know, fantastic there. And that's not something that we're targeting at this time um, today. So yeah, I think that's a very good thing that you're sort of uh, targeting the situation that we're talking about. So this is this is analytics. Uh, I'll go into what else to compare TileDB to separately. But there's there's one item which I think is uh, the key one push down that I'll try to explain in my words and then then uh, ask for your brief verification is correctly understood. I think most of the savings uh, build, uh, boil down to two things. One is that you store less data. You don't store the gaps. And because the gaps are not there, it doesn't take any time to read the gaps. So you save time by smaller size of data and then by the push down mechanism, which is equal to delegating the wear clause to the underlying storage engine so that the amount of data that you move from the storage engine up to MariaDB is smaller. So in a nutshell, is, is that correctly understood? Yeah, for, for the most part, that's correct. So the, the main benefit of the pushdown, like you say, is that for the predicates of the where clause, we can return less data to MariaDB. So in a columnar fashion that TileDB is, we can select the rows or records that match without pushing it all to MariaDB. Um, in the most basic case, the performance uh, improvements are, are quite large, as you saw, where we can actually return just less records. And a lot of this is because we can simply read less data, right? And if you read less data, then it comes back. Um, on the, the sparse side of the house, um, like you did mention, we, we do have a little bit of uniqueness in our arrays that you can actually not store those missing records. So some other array formats, um, everything's based on dents and those null fields get materialized. And then of course that's more data. And then when you read your ear impact on the performance. So we work very hard to minimize the amount of data in a lossless fashion, of course, that gets actually stored and then returned to MariaDB to optimize the performance there. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you use the term sparse and, and dense. So one of the things I'm wondering about is configuration. Do I need to, what do I need to configure and what will be decided by TileDB itself? Yeah, great question. So first of all, everything is always configurable by, by the user. We expose all the different um, configuration parameters from TileDB and even through uh, the My Tile Storage Engine directly. But generally for the different use cases, uh, it's pretty common a particular format uh, or parameters that'll be used. In fact, most of our converters to go from particular formats, say uh, image formats like GeoTIFF, um, you know, we have a, a set scripts that users use with de facto standards um, to, to handle that. So most of it's pretty well self-explanatory um, based off the, the domain that you're looking at. So, uh, okay, I, I get that. So. Uh... Let's say I wanted to use uh, TileDB. Uh, there's, there's two things uh, that I'm worried about then. It, it's the configuration and it's the learning. So you can config configure everything as such sounds like a wonderful thing, but then also it has the uh, flip side of, well, if, if you can configure it, it might mean that you have to configure it. So what do I need to learn to get, uh, in order to get the type of performance increases that, that you demonstrate? Right. Great, great question. So uh, again, we have, uh, def we have a lot of default um, settings for the different domains. Again, if you're converting image data, if you're converting, you know, sparse uh, location-based data, um, and most of the common tooling that you use outside of the database, for instance, like um, in the geospatial domain, like uh, Poodle or, or Joodle, we have integrations there and people in those geospatial domains, you know, they're familiar with that. So they can just use those to convert to the optimal TileDB format without much configuration. Inside the database itself, um, you know, in MariaDB, of course, we support all the, the syntax people expect. If you're going to create a new table, you want to set primary keys, we convert those into the TileDB um, syntax on the back end, you know, changing a primary key to the dimensions, um, worrying about the sparsity or not, if duplicates are supported. So we try to take the traditional create table schema, map those into the domain of the arrays, um, and handle most of the cases for the user um, without them having to, to dig into the details. Okay, good, good. So, um... As for licensing, then, uh, uh, is it, I mean, you, you said it's open source, so is the GPL version 2, all of it, or, or is there part of it that is not? Uh, how does the licensing work? Yeah, great question. So most of TileDB is MIT licensed, um, including the, the MyTile storage engine we've released under the MIT license. Some of our integrations um, will be in different um, licensing based off the application and the requirements there, some GPL, some uh, Apache license too, and, and, and vice versa. Um, but all of, all of what we showed today in the demonstration um, you know, falls under one of the, the open source license, MIT or, or there, um, thereabout. Yeah, and, and uh, not everybody, I mean, you have a background in MIT labs and, 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 and Intel, but uh, the user base of, of uh, MariaDB comes mostly from a GPL version 2 background. They might not be as well uh, versed in, in, in what MIT license means, but as far as I understand, MIT license is completely compatible with GPL version 2 and, and, and gives you more or less the same freedoms. Th that that's true? correct. That's correct. The MIT license, and again, I should say, I'm, you know, I'm not a lawyer here, but uh, MIT license, it, um, it's compatible with the GPL. It is probably more similar to the BSD style license, which, you know, I think some of uh, some of the MariaDB code is under. Um, more so than GPL, it's more BSD uh, kind of you can do what you want without so much restrictions on it. Um, but again, yes, we, we came out of in, uh, Intel and MIT, so we picked the MIT license for a lot of things here. But it, but it's um, everyone should be free to use it for uh uh, general purpose, like they would expect from again, like like a BSD style license. Mm -hmm. So, um, one thing that I noted that you do not compare TileDB to in your presentation is the MariaDB column store, and and to me it seems like it's it's very related. Yes, you, you have features that it does doesn't have, but, but basically it's an analytic engine. So so how would you compare it? conceptually and also if you had run your benchmarks against a properly configured column store, how do you think it would have fit into the equation? 
Yes, and first off, it's a it's a great question, and I'd love to uh, to include some benchmarks on the column store there. And like I mentioned in in, um, in the presentation, even the MyRox benchmarks I, I recognize are probably not super optimized. Um, as always with benchmarks, the, the most difficult part is the time to uh, to configure everything and, and agree upon uh, the settings there. I'd love to to work with people to to do that, um, but. From a conceptual standpoint, um, there are some similarities. Again, we are both column stores, right? We store the data in a columnar format, which helps drastically when you want to select uh, individual columns. Um, column store also, I think, supports the most advanced computational pushdowns. Um, as I noted in the presentation too, there was even some advanced handlers added uh, into the main line for um, like select handler uh, and derived table handler um, for that. So there's a lot of similarities there, but but there are some fundamental differences. Again, PyODB is based around the ideal of a multidimensional array, not a tabular structure. Uh, of course, an array can consume um, tabular structures, but it also, um, you know, expands beyond that. Um, there's also, you know, the minor differences, different compression support at Snappy, LZ4, you know, both have a plethora of, of configuration options there. Um, but, you know, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to do some, some more specific comparisons. I think the biggest difference, though, that I just want to highlight is the, uh, the shared nothing versus shared everything um, architectural differences that really come into play. TileDB is designed around a centralized um, data store, whether it's an object store or a shared file system. Um, it's designed around keeping all the data in a single location. Um, where the column store has the, the data workers to, to shard out the data there. So that is a bit of a structural difference um, that comes into play and allows TileDB to support, you know, object stores natively, even slicing directly from MariaDB. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, those were my major questions. Is there something that you, uh, are, with hindsight, forgot to tell during your own presentation or you would have wished me to, to ask and highlight? Uh, no, I, I think the, the main thing is, you know, um, I said this last year, but, you know, the pandemic's made things a little bit uh, tough on everybody here. But we are hoping to upstream um, the MyTile storage engine to the MariaDB um, uh, main repository soon. I've been working very hard to get it up to, uh, to the 10.6 um, uh, latest releases and uh, in the, the 10.7 um, branch that's going forward soon. So we are hoping very, very soon to get all of that documentation and whatnot together. So this will make it much easier for everyone to start running experiments and benchmarks against it. That sounds great, Seth. So I was thinking about how to start using it and that, that was the answer to the implicit question I had. So thanks a lot for being at the MariaDB server, and thanks for a great presentation, Seth. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here.